I'm not going to attempt to define poetry or even to give a definition of Roman and Greek poetry, and it's a far easier thing to not have to worry about the modern stuff. Classical poetry can be on a wide range of topics, from epic tales of heroes to descriptions of the countryside and philosophy and love. So we can't use theme to describe poetry, but we can use structure. Classical poetry is divided into lines, and we can also refer to these as verses. And in fact, you know, so is modern poetry. But modern English poetry is defined with stress and unstress. So here, take for instance, the great opening lines of Coleridge's Kubla Khan. In Zenadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree. The line revolves around the stresses. It's not quite as poetic to say Kubla Khan did decree a stately pleasure dome in Xanadu. There's way more to these lines than this, but on a simplistic level, the stress of the words in a line is important in English poetry. But the Romans and Greeks didn't revolve their poetic line around stressed and unstressed syllables. Instead, their line was based on the length of syllables. In some ways, this is good. As non-native Latin speakers, it can be tough to put the stress on the right place in the word. And it's a lot easier to learn how to determine which vowels are short and which vowels are long than to determine their stress. This video will illustrate this, finding the longs and shorts of Latin poetry and how putting all of this together can allow you to read Latin poetry correctly. And it can actually help you understand the Latin phrasing better. Just like with Kublai Khan, a Roman poet like Virgil or Ovid will be restricted in where he can place his words, but that doesn't mean he places his words at random in a line or wherever they fit. Learning the versification of Latin poetry is just one step in discovering the complex underlying structure of the Roman poetic line. Latin syllables are defined by the presence of a vowel sound. You can't have a syllable without a vowel sound, and two vowel sounds are two syllables. Consonants are just additions to the syllable. And you can think of vowels as peanut butter, and any consonants as the slices of bread. Sometimes you have a peanut butter sandwich with one slice of bread on either end. Sometimes it's an open-faced sandwich with just one consonant. And other times, you just have the peanut butter right out of the jar. Now, this Latin vowel sound is going to be either long or short. And when I say long or short, I'm referring to the length of time it should take you to say the vowel. The long takes about twice as long to say as the short. For a lot of long vowel sounds, we have a handy accent, the macron, that we put above long vowels. The macron is a good resource, but you won't necessarily have macrons. You know, they were invented in the Middle Ages, by the way, so the Romans didn't have them to identify long syllables. Luckily, we have several rules that we can follow. First off are what are called longs by nature. These are easy. These are syllables that are naturally long. So diphthongs, two vowels that together are pronounced as one vowel sound, are naturally long. The other longs by nature are vowels that you would find a macron over. So for instance, the A in the first declension ablative singular in we la is long. There's a whole bunch more long marks and endings and in regular words. You don't need to go through your endings again and relearn the macrons if you don't know them already. But if you happen to notice that, say, the accusative plural ending always has a long vowel, then keep that in mind. Let's move on from longs by nature and talk about longs by position. In a line of poetry, a syllable is long by position if it contains a vowel followed by two or more consonants. I call this the two consonant rule, and it's the most important rule in figuring out syllable length. You'd also think it's pretty easy to follow, but it's also pretty easy to forget. Okay, let's see it in action. At levior demptis poina du obus erit. Okay, so we'll mark long all of the vowels that are followed by two or more consonants. It doesn't matter if the consonants are in another word, by the way. So that's pretty easy, isn't it? Now, that doesn't mean that these are the only vowels that are long, because there may be some vowels that are long by nature, and in fact there are. The OE in poina is a diphthong, and so it's long by nature. And the O in duobus also is long by nature. So everything else will be short, which we'll mark with a little curve. Of course, there are some special points. You can call them exceptions, but they're just rules to keep in mind about longs by position. The X and Z count as double consonants. Since X is actually a K or a C or a G plus an S, and Z is really a D plus an S. 
Since they count twice, they always make the vowel that comes before them long. H, since it's really just a breath of air, doesn't count at all as a consonant. In fact, the Greeks who made up all of these rules originally didn't even have an H in their alphabet. So in the phrase ad hoc, the A in ad is short. QU counts as a single sound and only as one consonant. So this word equus has just two syllables and it's not pronounced equus. And the E in the first syllable is short. In the word linquera, there are only three syllables and the first syllable is long by position because of the N and the QU. Watch out for the Latin I, which can sometimes be a vowel and other times a consonant. The easy rule is that an I at the beginning of a word followed by a vowel is a consonant and pronounced like a Y, like yam or yungo. And this still stays a consonant even if you put a prefix on this word, like ajungo. But an I followed by a consonant or by a vowel but later on in the word is still a vowel, like in the word Italia, four syllables. And here's the toughest rule, a stop, which is where you stop the air to form a sound. These are a P, T, C, B, D, and G, followed by a liquid, which is a consonant formed with your tongue, so an L or an R, can count as either one or two consonants. So it doesn't necessarily make the vowel before it long. Think of it in English terms, a stop plus a liquid, like the BR in brown, is kind of just one consonantal sound. The more practice you have with these rules, the easier they'll get to remember until eventually you won't even think of them. One more note, when a word ends in a vowel or an M and the next word begins with a vowel or an H, since H doesn't count, we get what is called an elision. The last syllable of the first word goes away or is pronounced so lightly that it doesn't count for metrical purposes. The first syllable of the second word is scanned as it normally would, either long or short, according to the rules. And what we get is a slurred or an extra long word. This is decently common in classical poetry, so it's worth mentioning. What isn't really worth mentioning is the rare occasions where an elision should happen but doesn't. That's called a hiatus, but since it's very rare, I won't tell you about it. So, how do you put these rules to use? There are a whole bunch of combinations of long and short syllables called feet, but the two that really concern us are the dactyl, the long syllable followed by two shorts. The word dactyl, by the way, means finger in Greek, like a pterodactyl, the dinosaur whose wings, terra, stem from its fingers, the dactyls. Since our fingers happen to have a long bone tipped off by two short bones, which is like the long syllable followed by two short syllables. And the other foot that matters to us is the spondy, which is two long syllables. Remember, two shorts equals a long, so these two different types of feet take roughly the same amount of time to say. Since we're going to be concerned with epic poetry for the time being, the most important verse to learn is called dactylic hexameter. As hex and hexameter should tell you, this verse consists of six metrical feet. The first four are either a dactyl or a spondy, the last one is always a spondy, and the fifth foot is almost always a dactyl, although rarely it can be a spondy. Every line of epic poetry will fit into this pattern. When we scan a line of poetry, we, we determine the combination of dactyls and spondies that fit into the hexameter verse. And it's the combination of dactyls and spondies in each line that make the poetry variable, yet structured, and actually kind of beautiful to listen to. So keep in mind these rules for long and short syllables, and your practice scanning will make reading and understanding poetry easier. Mm -hmm.